Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Our top story, the U.S. moving to close a loophole in trade. President Biden announces tariffs on Chinese metal coming in through Mexico. Day two of the Global Arsenal of Democracy Summit in Washington. What NATO allies unveiled about their plans to support Ukraine and why China has become a decisive enabler of Russia's war effort. Washington's new top envoy to Taiwan is meeting with the island's president. What's his message amid looming China threats? First of all, and the most important thing, and a new round of flooding hits a major metropolis in southwestern China, triggering landslides and flooding streets. The days of a U.S. trade loophole are numbered. President Biden announced new measures Wednesday to stop cheap Chinese metal from evading U.S. tariffs by being funneled through Mexico. The move comes just four months ahead of the 2024 presidential election. The Biden administration said it would slap tariffs on Mexican steel and aluminum partially made in China, specifically a 25 percent tariff for imported Mexican steel if it was smelted or cast outside of North America. In the past, Mexican steel entered the U.S. market duty-free. For Mexican aluminum, the tariff sits at 10 percent. That's if it includes metal cast in China, Belarus, Iran or Russia. Lau Brainerd is the director of the White House National Economic Council. She said Chinese steel and aluminum entering the U.S. through Mexico hurts American workers in Pennsylvania and Ohio, adding the U.S. would act. The U.S. is working out the tariffs with Mexico. The latter is asking importers to provide more information about where its steel comes from. Last year, the U.S. imported 3.8 million tons of steel from Mexico. About 13 percent of that was melted or poured outside of North America. The U.S. imported over 100,000 tons of aluminum from Mexico in 2023. Six percent of that was smelt or cast in countries, including China. As for steel directly coming from China, President Biden tripled tariffs on it to 25 percent in May. China makes about half of the world's steel. That production is backed by state subsidies, so it can't be sold at cheaper prices. Domestically, China can't consume all of that steel, so it gets exported to other countries. The U.S. has raised issues with Beijing about the overcapacity issue, though concerns remain for the U.S. auto industry. If Chinese-made electric cars are assembled in Mexico, they can enter the U.S. market either duty-free or with only a 2.5 percent tariff rate. Either way, China could sell its EVs well below typical U.S. market prices. The Alliance for American Manufacturing has warned cheap Chinese EVs could be a, quote, extinction-level event for the U.S. auto industry. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security is upgrading sanctions on China's forced labor practices. To do that, it's updating a rule called the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. Its goal is to block Chinese products made with forced labor from entering the United States. Now, Washington has designated three more industries as high-priority sectors, aluminum, PVC and seafood. That's on top of other listed products like clothing, cotton and tomatoes. And also in Washington, the U.S. and its defense allies from Europe are gathering for a NATO summit. Four Asian partners are joining them, too. Their goal, countering the Chinese Communist Party and its allies. NTD White House correspondent Iris Tao has more. As world leaders gather here in D.C. for the NATO summit, President Biden's calling on these leaders to produce more defense equipment more quickly as Russia is making more weapons with the help from China. Here's President Biden speaking at a working session this morning. Watch. They've, they're significantly ramping up their production of weapons, munitions and vehicles. And they're doing it with the help of China, North Korea and Iran. We cannot, in my view, we cannot allow the alliance to fall behind. And President Biden also highlights the tens of billions of dollars of investments that the U.S. is making in our defense manufacturing. President Biden in recent months has been increasingly warning that the Chinese communist regime is providing Russia with materials and equipment used in the war against Ukraine. In addition to protecting Europe, the NATO Secretary General on Wednesday emphasized the need to maintain a focus on the Indo-Pacific. And we will reinforce our partnerships uh, in the Indo-Pacific to push against the growing alignment of Russia 
Russia, China, Iran and North Korea. In their final joint statement to be released this week, NATO leaders are expected to call out China's threats to Western countries. And President Biden will hold a press conference at the NATO summit on Thursday, and he's expected to cover both domestic and foreign topics. Reporting from the White House, Iris Tao, NTD News. The world's biggest military alliance is hosting a summit in Washington, but as NATO leaders gather, China and Belarus are launching military drills near the border of a NATO member country, Poland. Here's the Polish Deputy Defense Minister with his country's response. China has global interests in Europe, and they have to reach Europe somehow, and everyone is aware of that. The territory of Belarus is naturally the route between Europe and China, and I think China doesn't want the bad things to happen there. Poland's deputy defense minister hinted at a border closure between it and neighboring country Belarus. That kind of move could also mean the shutdown of a railroad that transports Chinese goods to Europe. Here's the tricky part. Right now, Chinese troops have traveled thousands of miles to hold a joint to drill with Belarus, and the division is clear. On one side of the border, both China and Belarus side with Moscow in the Ukraine war. On the other, NATO and dozens of other countries all strongly supporting Ukraine, plus Poland, a NATO member, is just miles from the drills. At the same time, the Polish official appears to be looking beyond the border itself to a possible escalation of the war. He said he hopes the NATO summit will include discussion about whether his country has permission to shoot down missiles from Russia while they're still in the air over Ukrainian territory. Worth noting, if any NATO country in Europe is attacked, other allied countries, including the U.S., are obligated to come to its defense. Beijing intensifying its cracking down on corrupt officials, and experts says the aim is to fill up its treasury coffers. Here's more. Beijing's official data says China investigated 17,000 corrupt officials in May. Secretary Zhang, is today your birthday or the party's birthday? In early July, a social media post exposed an incident involving the top communist official in one village in Heilongjiang province. He was found to have treated all local Communist Party members to a fancy meal on the public's dime. Angry citizens caught it on camera and posted the proof online. China's anti-corruption watchdog lists official misconduct as including bribery and unauthorized spending, or using public funds for private purposes. Since Chinese leader Xi Jinping took office over 10 years ago, China has been pushing anti-corruption efforts nonstop, but with little success. The problem has only gotten worse. Australia-based historian Li Yuanhua says corruption is the norm under the ruling Chinese Communist Party. There are millions of officials. They are easy targets of CCP's anti-corruption. The regime's officialdom is filled with corruption, misconduct and disorder. It's a norm. Xing Chen Xing, a U.S.-based China affairs analyst, says the CCP itself breeds corruption. The greedy officials won't hesitate to collect the money, especially when the economy is bad. Any investigation could easily identify a large group of officials involved. According to Xing, Beijing wants the corrupt officials to give back the money they stole to help pay for the state expense in the time of economic downturn. Xi Jinping needs money for his agenda such as military. Qing said many officials have accumulated large wealth, often millions or tens of millions of dollars, and Xi Jinping is well aware of it. Anti-corruption movements in China could have another effect, helping the Chinese Communist Party's top leadership purge officials it doesn't like. Two former defense ministers were recently dispelled from the CCP. Now, they're being investigated for corruption and bribery. But General Robert Spaulding, national security analyst, believes there's another reason behind the move. We spoke to him for more info. General Spaulding, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Thanks. Great to be back. Now, when it comes to China's military, China has finally confirmed that Li Shanfu and Wei Fenghe, two former defense ministers who vanished from the public eye for over a year, were under investigation for corruption. Now, what does all of this mean in terms of China's combat readiness? Well, President Xi uh, has, or, or, or Chairman Xi, has been working you know, feverishly to get the 
People's Liberation Army up to standard in terms of being able to conduct an invasion of Taiwan or fight a war in the South China Sea, for example. And part of that professionalization is weeding out corruption in its ranks. You know, it's hard to say in China whether corruption is really corruption or corruption is really just purging to ensure um, loyalty to Xi's regime. That's one of the challenges of a Marxist-Leninist system, you know, uh, and in, in particular because in China you don't have rule of law, you have rule by law. In other words, the Chinese Communist Party uh, is the judge, jury, and executioner, even though they have this whole other judiciary that's meant to show hey, an impartial uh, legal system. In fact, you know, we don't know for sure if those two gentlemen were actually corrupt or the Communist Party is saying they're corrupt because they want to purge them and get uh, others that are more loyal to Xi. What I will say is, you know, I've been looking at this for several years now. In fact, I was in Mar-a-Lago during the first summit between Xi and President Trump, and I escorted a General Fang Feng Hui. And, you know, as soon as he got back to China, within a few months, he was purged. So you never know who's going to be next on the list in a Marxist-Leninist system. Does it really contribute to a more professional force? I think that's really not a question of concern, considering the overwhelming number of weapons and ships and planes that China's produced. And, and we haven't really matched that. So I, I think Rather than being concerned about, you know, whether or not these generals are making a difference, I think we should look at the over overwhelming force that China can bring to bear in a Taiwan conflict and understand that that's significant. And we need to think about how we might deter that. And I've said nuclear weapons is, is a way, um, but, you know, we're not going to do it unless we actually have a plan. Expanding on that, given these officials, what does this tell us about Beijing's leadership in fighting? What is the state of mind for Xi Jinping? You know, that's one of the hardest nuts to crack in the world in terms of an intelligence collection perspective. The Chinese Communist Party is very good at, um, at uh, sealing off the rest of the world when it doesn't want you to know what's going on. And I think, you know, in terms of, you know, their, you know, how they protect against you know, officials using cell phones. I mean, they are very, very, uh, they know that the NSA is really good at, at listening into an eavesdropping on their communication. So they're pretty tight lipped and, and they have um, also, you know, these very strict rules in terms of bringing devices into places and so forth. So I don't think we uh, actually know um, very much about, you know, what is going on with regard to China's leadership and I think that system is designed to keep us uh, guessing. Uh, unfortunately, we have to make some assumptions based on the nature of the regime, and then we need to take some affirmative action that protects our own interests, you know, because it's likely that we're not going to have the information before something happens. General Spaulding, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Washington's new top envoy to Taiwan meeting with the island president Wednesday, he brought a message with him that the U.S. strongly supports the island's self-defense. Here's more. First of all, and the most important thing, the U.S. will strongly support Taiwan's self-defense capabilities. Green is the U.S.'s de facto ambassador to the Taiwan. The Chinese Communist Party sees Taiwan as part of China despite never having ruled the island. Washington doesn't have formal diplomatic relations with the island, but is bound by law to help defend itself. Taiwan's president said he would strive to maintain the status quo with Beijing. In June, the U.S. State Department approved $360 million worth of weapon sales to Taiwan. A metropolis in southwestern China hit by the largest wave of flooding so far this year. The city is called Chongqing. Heavy rainfall flooded streets and triggered landslides there. The water level of local rivers inching closer to its overflow warning level, now just 13 feet away from disaster. In one district, over 450 residents have been displaced. Weather forecasters say total rainfall would reach up to 8 inches over the next two days. In Hubei province, floodwaters have left cars half-submerged and trapped some residents inside multi-story apartment buildings. 
Heavy rain is expected over the next two days across southern China. Affected regions include Chongqing, Sichuan, Anhui, and Jiangsu. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for three years. If you'd like to support us, consider donating. Find us at donorbox.org slash China dash in dash focus or subscribe to our partner platform Epic TV where you can watch our full episodes. Just click the link down below. Here's what to look out for in our second half. Developing countries reap benefits for economy, technology, and more, but China has evolved into the most controversial nation to enjoy the status. The media and world leaders often call it a superpower. We take a closer look. PRC is not a developing country. It is the second largest world economy only after the United States, yet most favored nation no more. Washington curbing China's economic prowess by taking away a special trade privilege. What could it mean for tariffs and U.S.-China trade? And new data shows China has filed more generative AI patents than the United States. But is it quantity over quality? More on that after the break here on China in Focus. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you tomorrow.